Yep. All right, so we're here at Clemic Performance Method, um, 2511 Fire Road in EHT. It's a studio. I'm here with books, breakdowns, some of my favorite segments of the week because I learned something too. Normally, I'm up teaching, um, and I think we both learned something when uh, we listened absolutely. to Tuck last week. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty glaring. It Even if you disagree with them, you cannot say that that's not a compelling argument, right? Absolutely. 100% it was blowing my mind. And we, we watched the episode last night as a family, and I'm pretty sure my wife's a vegan now. Like She's like, <laughs> she's sold. So, like, I woke up and like she's, like, cooking broccoli for my son. And I'm like, all right. So she's – it was very powerful. It was awesome. I learned a lot of something – you know, to kind of keep an eye on, and if it interests you, you know, you maybe you, maybe you take that path. Yeah, and I like for some people, he is a obviously a very very disciplined person. Absolutely, maybe it's not for everybody, but the information is there. And I know when you get into a real like a situation like cancer and stuff, my mother in law does the same thing. She's a clinical nutritionist. She has to completely get people off of meats and sure. dairy and stuff like that, and go almost completely vegan and then organic everything and it almost these are the tr pathways for um people with that are trying to like uh, dull the effects of autism sure uh, and um if people are seeing signs of autism they do the same right. thing you're seeing signs of cancer you do the same thing so it's it's interesting like we talk about injury prevention but like he's in essence speaking about nutrition prevention in a right. way but a lot of us, again, a lot of us won't make that change until we're actually sick or we won't care about ACL rehab until we blow our ACL right. or prehab. So it's just, it's interesting. And, um, it's, yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah. So the, uh, getting the meat and the potatoes for today, I mean, we had, I had a couple questions just because I, like, I learned so much during the segment. Um, we spend time, most of the time teaching here. So when I learn something new and, and again, I think I've heard it all. And I was going to be a PT if I wasn't doing this. And uh, I have learned from you a, a bit, a large amount, because even the stuff that I was I was learning, going, you know, taking anatomy, physiology classes, and stuff like that, kinesiology, um, chemistry, breaking. There's no way that as many P, anybody that I know has had as much experience in PT as you have with athletes. I've never seen it before. It's just I've never seen it done. So. The, in in that way, and you've seen the ACL rehabs with girls and boys sure. and everything like that. And I just kind of want to see what you say about um, the the ACL, the rehab, the the prehab, and everything like kind of what is your method um, with an athlete versus a non-athlete? As far as addressing ACL prevention, yeah. Well, I think obviously they need an individualized assessment because there's deficits. Like there's hypermobility that could contribute. There might be hip mobility deficits that lead to more stress on the knee. Uh, me and Josh were talking earlier about like there's a philosophy called GOTA now, and they're trying to teach everybody to stay basically out of valgus stress, but they're kind of forcing them into like a varus stress or, or right. keeping their leg bowed to eliminate it. And like, is that really, I understand the concept, but can you do that? from the ground up if they don't have enough hip mobility because the foot affects the knee which affects the hip so if you're just shoving a movement pattern that they can't truly acqu acquire because of a limitation up the chain like is, is that a philosophy that'll work I, I don't know like that's something that like my my brain has been on and I've been watching um but I'm not sure so I, I think just an individualized approach understanding the athlete in front of you and, and that there might be different than the the second the, the next athlete that you see from a anatomical perspective mobility perspective strength perspective goal perspective like sometimes there's just risk reward and uh another thing we were talking about is like with training and sport there comes an inherent injury risk so like do we want to <coughs> are we going to keep them a female out of playing field hockey because she's on her menstrual cycle knowing that there's a higher chance of retear or we're going to let her compete because she wants to compete like there's so many factors that right. go into it so again like doc talked about i think giving them Getting them strong, getting them strong in single leg stability, making sure they have the adequate mobility and stability con to control valgus stress, uh, and understanding the importance of neuromuscular exercises to get their muscles on prior to playing and get them to be able to control movement as best they are when they're playing is 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 the general goal. Right. Because I've actually went 
I'm, we look and assess our athletes, and we look at you know Valgus Vera's angling, and if it's a certain percentage past there, I'll immediately call you. I go, you know, you, sure. you got to call Ryan first because I think you're a little bit too much for for me. Or if there's too much weight distribution, right or left, right, and it's a Varus and a Valgus um, yep. on, and I've seen that happen too. And I'll, I'll give you a call too, and I think I think this is a little bit past what I can teach him, and I think it'll perpetuate just by continuing to train. It's going to perpetuate bad habits. So I'll call you, but that's changed for me. Even since us talking, so that's changed because I've seen in run looking at sagittal plane or like looking them uh, or even a profile view, it's hard, it's harder to see. But I can see when there's running where the hip is internally rotating or externally rotating, and it might not be from the knee. You're it's right. not the knee; it was the hip, and that actually changed my perspective because I didn't really think of it through the hip too much. And I we train the hip like crazy. Sure. And since the iliopsoas will lift and internally rotate the the hip, I'm like, oh man we could be actually perpetuating it even worse right so um there's like other exercises that need to be done that stabilize and there's equipment that you have that we just don't have sure. so i am asking that question actually for me to know when to refer I, to you yeah, more. I and think, it's changed yeah i think the biggest again the biggest start is really understanding you you have to screen hip knee and foot and ankle and their interplay all have to be as unison or on the same page as possible from a mobility, stability, and control standpoint to control knee valgus, right? right? And, and then if we're seeing a valgus or we're seeing a bed, where's it coming from? What's the biggest co- contributing factor? And then hit the low-hanging fruit first. And right. every athlete, that could be slightly different. All right. Awesome. Mean? All right, we're going to take a break right here and go see our little our Tracer commercial right here, and we'll be back after that. And we're going to play testing has its limits and i think the tracer and this is gets me excited but if we can hook them up to a tracer we can have true objective data even better than what we're doing now and, and that's why the return to play testing it's still evolving it's progressing it needs to continue to evolve because we're not perfect at it but something like the tracer like that's kind of game changing for me all right so as far as like static flexibility how important is it just to be straight up static flexible flexible just, can you touch your toes and how far can you, you know, stretch your quad? And is that important? Is there any importance to that at all? So through an assessment standpoint, yes. And But you have to understand what the static mobility assessment tells us. And I always go back to one of my first things I look at every athlete is their ability to toe touch. When I was taught, we were taught toe touch was their hamstring flexibility. And we're like, yeah, kind of, maybe. But there's also toe touch can tell us a lot about the compression in their posterior pelvis. So if they're pelvis is compressed and their hip muscles are tight their pelvis will be pulled back into like a posterior tilt or sway back is a common thing so that ability if they have a sway back posture right tight rotators of the hip and their toe touch is limited now i'm thinking these this guy probably lacks the ability to internally rotate which could be a huge or externally rotate but we won't go there but my brain's thinking internal rotation first so that that's giving me a quick assessment to we have to improve his toe touch but i'm not going to do it through traditional methods probably and as his toe touch improves his hip internal rotation should improve and his ability to get in good positions and rotate efficiently should improve. So I think static assessment's important. I do them all the time. In pitchers, I look at horizontal abduction. I lay them on the table. I check their right arm versus their left arm. I see how their arm sits. I'm not thinking, wow, they're limited horizontal abduction. I have to stretch their pec. I'm going to put it together with other assessment tools, such as maybe internal rotation. And if I see a cluster of lack of horizontal abduction with active internal rotation now i'm starting to think okay they might have a compressed rib cage on that side right that's not allowing to abduct and internal rotate so what does that mean what how do i affect that change probably not through static stretching right. probably through other means to improve their ability to get an abduction and ir which is super important now for the throw <laughs> does right. that make sense yeah, so i think the pr- static yeah, measurements tell us a lot but i think where a lot of people struggle and, and i struggled and learned and failed and is understanding what they're telling us and how to really fix them you don't have lack of horizontal abduction and just shove them in horizontal abduction for 30 seconds you right. might but it's, there's probably a lot better ways you have to right. understand what it's telling us and how to how to affect those changes right so <clears> and, I, and i we were talking about the arm a lot but you know our athletes at that in me, too, like, how we say this, if I could just, when I pray, 
I'm gonna when I meet God, I'm gonna ask him why he made hamstring so susceptible to injury because sure. it ended my career. It wasn't even my broken leg actually. It was a com it constant hamstring yeah. pulls. And the guys that are really really fast have seen so many hamstring yeah. pulls. It's a huge epidemic yeah. uh, in the you know football world and stuff like that, track and field. Sure. Um, so I kind of want to get into maybe the pulling of the hamstring has a lot to do with the hip and the way the pelvis rotates and stuff like that. Maybe you could go in that because I know that's a hot topic. Right. I mean, e- even when I r- type in, I'm like, what are hot topics in the yeah. PT world? Hamstring number one. Hamstrings are they're tough. They're tough to treat. Once they're strained, they are tough to treat. Like you don't know how bad it is till the pain goes away, and it's 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 still prognostically difficult. But from an assessment standpoint, that you have to start proximal and understanding hip how the pelvis affects the hip affects the straight leg raise or hamstring tension. I think is like number one, right? So if you're if you're in an anterior tilt, say slightly more on the left. So tight hip flexor, your straight leg raise less on that side because the pelvis is rotated. Now you have an asymmetry left to right in straight leg raise, right? So what are the tests that you do for that? Uh, first, I'll do so toe touch, see what they're doing. Mm. So I'm thinking, okay, they're gonna have a bad toe touch. There's some tension in the posterior chain. Then I lay them supine and I literally look at their, see how they perform a straight leg raise right to left, see what their pelvis is doing. Is it a true straight leg raise? Are they dumping their pelvis to create a fake straight leg raise? So I'm trying to look to see, right? Then I'll break into like a 90-90 true hamstring mobility. So now we're starting to put the pieces of, we know they're (coughs) tight posteriorly, we know they're tight straight leg raise, and they have some tightness in their 90-90. So they're true hamstring mobility. Now, again, it goes back to the why. So if it's, if it's, you start clustering that, if then they lack hip internal rotation on that side, now it's like bingo, they have a rotated pelvis on that side. So I'm going to pull their pelvis back or give them methods to improve their hip flexor mobility or, or drive active hamstring contraction to pull their pelvis out of a slightly anterior tilt. And then we're going to recheck. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of different methods and techniques to do that. If I can affect the change where I can improve their straight leg raise, improve their toe touch in 30 seconds, and I didn't do one hamstring stretch, we realized, you know, that's like we have to affect pelvis position and hip mobility to affect the tension on the hamstring. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's <coughs> fascinating. And it, of I usually see if I – anybody I've ever seen, 90% of the time, biceps – femoris is the one that's pulled yeah. I mean, the, of the three that's the one that goes the most why would it be that one and not the other two that's i honestly don't know I, like that's it's so true and there's probably a biomechanic I'd, I'd have to like think about it in the pool from the pelvis position um i, I don't yeah, i don't i, I don't like, know the 100 percent. well i can tell you from running and why yeah. I, that's always the one i would pull i could i used yeah. to do it I, nine out of ten myself. that i see in clinic is is by so I yeah. agree, and I was I would almost always do it on a post corner corner post whatever you when I'm going at full speed and I go boom, boom and I'm coming off the right side yeah. turning left or left side turning right upfield and I'd go bing I just feel it right there and I'm like oh man so it got me real scared to run that type of route so and it was always biceps femoris I know there's semi tendinosis and semi membranosis there's almost no effect whatsoever yeah. sometimes I feel the pain like rotate back and forth yeah, it was all kind usually of multiple fibers not but yeah, but, but, um, yeah that, that's for somebody smarter but that's yeah the but the <coughs> The whole thing with me with uh, our athletes is going, we don't even let them run too far on the fear that as hard as they go in here all the time, we have to protect them from their their own self. Sure. So we go at 100% maximum effort every single run in here, every single jump. There's no pace. So going at anything past acceleration, you start to touch the ground and you're starting to pull the right. ground. And it's really this whip and touch back to the ground where that actually – that pull happens when right. you're eccentrically loading it to hit it back to the ground. And I think that most of the stress must come in when the foot's rotated and that foot is the out, the outer part of your foot is touching the ground. That's which, my only, which is probably puts my, that makes, I think but it so, fascinates me. And I, it's the one thing I go, gosh, if I could have just corrected that, I would have had a longer career. Yeah. Um, all, everybody would. And Charlie Francis actually came to talk to us. who was the Olympic sprint coach in yeah. Canada, super famous coach worked with Ben Johnson. And, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> These guys were fast. They didn't, right. always, they didn't always play by the rules, but this guy's really <laughs> right. fast. Uh, Donovan Bailey and everybody. So, I mean, Charlie uh, was saying how we do corrective work to the hamstring. And, and um, he was like, you know, well, first of all, you guys are 
you guys are just way too much volume right. first. That's the first thing. Throw right. the throw down the volume. You guys got to hit the brakes big time. You're way too much. And I'm like, he's like, here's what our track guys are doing, and then here's what your guys are doing, and no wonder they're getting hurt so much. Right. And uh, and it, it, you look back at you know even professional coaches, Dick Vermeule would be like. Sorry, like yeah. I didn't know. Sure. Like, how the heck was I supposed to know that? You know, we were throwing too much fun. Our strength conditioning coaches didn't know. Yeah. Charlie Francis knew. So, um, it's one of those fascinating it's evolution, that, right? Yeah. We're still learning, and yeah. we'll continue to learn. And that's change. why we're doing this yeah. right now. One hundred percent. We'll be right back. We're gonna do one more uh, shout out to the Tracer, and we'll be right, right back after that. And learn to play testing has its limits and i think the tracer and this is gets me excited but if we can hook them up to a tracer we can have true objective data even better than what we're doing now and, and that's why the return to play testing it's still evolving it's progressing it needs to continue to evolve because we're not perfect at it but something like the tracer like that's kind of game changing for me all right so i mean this is probably the most glaring red light subject we, we we're going to talk about right now is the arm care that's something that you do something you specialize in um nationally recognized right now you have a lot of pros coming to you from all over the place you don't have to give us your secrets but tell us your uh tell us your approach and why and and, and the how sure so i think one of the and this is something i've talked about a lot at a baseball performance center and dealing with the guys is Arm care itself, the term, I think, is almost antiquated at this point. I've used it, and, like, I get it, and, but it's, it's really full-body care, and it's, it's really, as a PT, understanding, like, how the lower half affects the upper half and how the, the arm's kind of the result of the effects from the ground up, right? So your assessment has to be valued almost more understanding the lower half than actually the arm now there's things at the arm that are important we know general total arc of motion is important flexion mobility is important external rotation mobility and strength super important serratus strength and low and lower trap strength and endurance are important dynamic stabilization of the cuff all these things are important and they're in and there's a lot of good pts and i see instagram all the time of the coolest arm arm specific exercises to get the cuff strong get the scapula strong but then there's other considerations we really have to consider. And a lot of times even more, because they've been a lot of these guys, I'm dealing with pros, they own pro teams, they're doing all the coolest, you know, the coolest arm care, arm care exercises ever. But nobody looked at the rib cage, nobody looked at their pelvis, nobody's they're addressing hip mobility, but they're not addressing it from a pelvic standpoint. They're just giving them hip cars or 9090 switches, but like not understanding joint position. Uh, you're right yeah. that, if that makes sense and uh, I, I i bring this up and i have to ask you and um because and i said this right in the first segment it was like nobody deals with that athletes like you there's no pt that i've ever heard i'm around a lot i've seen a lot i work with a lot of people um in the past and then once i figured out how much you were just and it's a big risk for you to do that because sure. there's not a lot of money in that now there is but now like a lot less it's all in medicare people, right yeah, so i remember people. when you were in the smaller uh, you know smaller practice and sure. you were like you know go i want to go work with the athletes well so does everybody yeah but now you're you have so much experience with it that i you're the evolution of what you've done as a pt is um it's unbelievable so for anybody else to go in there and just talk about arm care i've seen some other people just do arm care they're not a pt they're yeah. not they're not have nothing to you know there's no like background for it they just sure. go i saw this on on yeah you know on uh, instagram whatever so we're going to do that right but your understanding of how this is working from the ground could it's all affected from yeah. the ground up which is which is really neat because if you think about um where your power is coming from it all has to we it, you know no matter what you can bench no matter how strong you are that stuff doesn't matter when you're creating leverage if you're not using the ground correct. Absolutely. So your bench press is meaningless if you don't push from the ground. Yep. So I'll you get know. I'll get assessments, and th I mean you can ask my guys, and I'll get God bless some people to travel to me, and I'm going to get an arm care assessment. I'm like okay, and literally we spend an hour on lower half, back leg, because none of it matters if we if our lower half is crap and our back leg isn't working well. And usually the imbalances we see in the upper half that have occurred, it's because there's a compensation due to the lower half first. And nobody's addressed their lower half well, or nobody's addressed their back leg well, or they just gave them, again, mo like general mobility. And I've been blessed with reps. Like, I've been blessed by seeing so many 
athletes and, right. and 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 learning and seeing like this isn't working and being able to like, not only say experiment but learning what's worked what hasn't following people smarter to me learning from them um that i've got to like you know i feel like i have a really good grasp now which i'm sure will change in a year you know always evolve but of like what we should be addressing first and what's getting missed a lot even in the mainstream and um so i i think that's Again, it's been a blessing, um, but I, th- I think it's that the lower half importance and understanding joint position. Yeah. Joint position dictates mobility and strength. So if we're ignoring joint position to start and we're just going right to getting somebody more mobile or stronger, we're like completely missing the boat. And that concept, I think, is, is it's confusing in the pelvis. It's confusing in the shoulder complex. So we just give somebody side external rotation because it's strengthening their cuff, not realizing that – if the joint's in a poor position, you can only get it so strong. Yeah. But if we improve position, we'll naturally yeah. get stronger. Does, that, does yeah. that make sense? So, so if you're like, when uh, when I hear like someone's going, oh, well, this guy, he didn't even have you doing this or this or this. Oh, because you have you don't have you don't have those nuances of going. You're just doing this. You he didn't even have you doing external rotation, whatever, with a band. No. Mm-mm. Now, there, someone could actually complain that you weren't doing mm-hmm. that, but then there, th- that's a person that's like, it's like, well, I, it's like these uneducated fans that watch mm-hmm. football and go, "How come the defense stinks?" You're, right, right. you're like, "What are you talking about?" They're yeah. like one of the best defenses versus the pass in the league. They just are not an educated person. Well, I think you it. have to, and that's part of like I've learned too is you have to be able to, to speak to patients and clients and parents and like make it make sense to them. I always say that in everything in life, like. Just make it make sense. Like, make it make sense why we're doing this. Get Then if they're bought in, you're making it sense. You brought it in their terms. You demonstrated. You showed an athlete for this, this. Right now, they're bought in. Now they're like, all right, Book isn't crazy. Maybe they still think I'm crazy. Once they start seeing improvements, then they, the trust factor, right, to yeah. rapport. But I think the education component to an athlete, like you guys do all the time, builds trust. And then you have to obviously show results or the trust is out the window, yeah. right? So Yeah, it's one thing that I think uh – we've seen is the end what what the end game for what we're teaching right here is actually to build trust because mm-hmm. you're going why should i use you yeah what do you know mm-hmm. that i don't this guy doesn't know i could go anywhere and where i could but take my the phillies trainers i got the right you know yeah. uh why go here and i don't think that understanding would be made in a and you don't have to redo it all the time which yeah. is what we talk about um is um you know compliance and and understanding and and trust because you're you're, you're somebody who's not educated. If they knew, it's like investing. If you knew that it was going to work, yeah. you would do it. You're like, if I knew I put money in this stock, it's right. going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to do it. I know that. If I don't know and it's just like a guess, I'm not putting money there. Sure. I'm just afraid to put my time. And if you think about your currency being your repetition, you're not going to put repetition in, in, in what you say. There's not yeah. going to be compliance. There's not going to be trust. So this is kind of why we do this right here, this discussion. And um, it's it's working mm-hmm. for our athletes. They're getting an edge from it. You're seeing your athletes get an edge from it. it happens to us all the time. Uh, one of those things where um, we'll educate up here in the beginning. Yeah. We call it the fastest minute in sports performance. We spend the minute. We talk, and then we go here to the long version. Yeah. So then you edit everything, we repeat. I don't have that much time with them. Right. Just like you only have an hour or whatever with yeah. your guys, but you want to keep teaching them. Yep. you got to cover a lot that first assessment. Yeah. Right. So you can go in here, and that's why we do this. So um, there is a purpose, whether it was, you know, we're really not the people that are going after likes or whatever. We actually are trying to educate our core group of people and then everybody else i mean if you get some from it great um but last but not least i did want to go over compliance and why that's such a factor and i think we just kind of talked about it with the trust but compliance if you were um in if you were not um consistent with your lessons or your when you show you know just showing up every now and then how does that affect healing? How does that affect your brain, your processes, your responses, yep. and or in the people that are, you know, uh, and, and where's the difference in um, time to heal? Right. So I think uh, compliance is is still sometimes a struggle for, for my guys. Um, they start feeling good. Their velocity climbed. Usually a lot of them, then it's humble time. My shoulder started hurting again or my velo is cl- – and then it's <coughs> – what happened and then then we start discussing did you follow the plan i laid out well it was but then i stopped i started feeling good i started right so i think again it comes back to education the importance a lot of times being a lot of like like you like i've athletes from sixth grade to now are in college so a lot of them 
is building the trust over the years, some speed bumps along the way, and the guys that see the results, and sometimes a speed bump is the biggest blessing, a little speed bump, then they're like, okay, I got to take this serious, right? Um, so I, I think that's, it's, it's always, I think, in when you're not just playing the sport, but you're doing the training or the preventative stuff or the stuff to make you good at sport, I think most athletes rather just go play the sport. So it's, again, giving a clear plan, building trust, getting them through some speed bumps, seeing, building a culture around you of people that have succeeded, right, and, and who've also, who've, who've, like, worked with you and have trust in you definitely helps, right, validates what we're doing. Um, so I, th- I just think it's multi, it's it's always going to be a struggle in pre- with prevention stuff, um, but education's key. Having an uh, improved performance on the field will give buy-in as well, and then some speed bumps in education along the way is, I think, part of the process. And one other thing I want to toot your horn for a second, just like kind of like we do the same thing, but you have – I think people's fear of that is going, ah, oh, this is going to be so boring. Mm-hmm. I just don't, I don't want to sit in there <laughs> right. and have the, you know, you know, music, soft music playing in the background. Yeah. And then, no, your spot has got culture to it. That's like, this is fun. Yeah, and true. this is cool. And through the windows, you're looking at people, f- baseballs flying around, yeah. pros everywhere. Um, and the music is kind of pumping, and it's a kind of a cool atmosphere. I like what you said. It's not a bad place to go to work. No, nah, you know? not, not bad. Uh, I love that. That's the same way we do here. And I think even that intensifies your attention to detail uh, yep. because you're ever, you see other people around you doing it. You're seeing a pro. That culture, yeah, yeah. culture is huge, and that's huge with buy-in and trust. And right. like, yeah, you see. I'm working on somebody and Chase Petty's on the table doing his exercise. Like that helps to be like, well, he's doing them. Yeah. He throws pretty good, yeah. you know. So that's that's cool. Um, but yeah, it's 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 culture. Culture is a huge component. Yeah. Component. Um, and uh, a funny story. Um, I've been on a table in um, with Kevin um, uh, down in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. Kevin. Uh, Kevin Wilk. Kevin Wilk. Yeah. He was my PT. One of the, the world girl. renowned. Yeah, he's like the best ever, girl. right? So I'm sitting next. I'm um, on his table, and John Rocker, a pitcher uh, yeah. who was a very controversial pitcher, uh, yeah. to gas um, though. Yeah, uh, sit lays right next to me. He's eating uh, a burger and mm. uh, you know fries or whatever from like Chick Fil A. I forget. I don't. And uh, he said, "You know, you don't bring food in the training room." That's right. just like whatever. I, Kevin's the nicest guy in the world until Rocker did that. Yeah, and he. He goes, what are you doing? You got to put that stuff down. So he just dropped it on the ground. Oh my and god! And Kevin grabbed him by the shirt and threw him out. <laughs> That's wow. Uh, Allen Iverson right next sure. to him. Chris what Weber you, right next to yeah, him. Yeah, if you Steve have Carse, athletes, Jerry Pate. You have athletes. You have to be able to speak to them like an yeah. athlete wants to be spoken to. You want to create a culture that makes them competitive but fun and loose and not overly serious i mean that's again it's i think huge important in the healing process and the performance process to push people to keep them motivated to keep them wanting to come so that's that's super important to me and my team and something like i'm passionate about even to change in our profession to make us if you're make us more like that or not be afraid to step out the box a little bit Um, do me a favor, shout out your team there, actually. So my team, John Husta, he's been taking the lead for my Northfield office as I left. I love him. He's been with me four or five years. Rockstar PT. We've done all the training together that I've done. Awesome guy. Uh, just uh, uh, Nancy Weber, my assistant, who's been with me for 12 years. She's like, without her, I probably would have failed. Been living in my car. <laughs> She's like the best, the best human, the best clinician i've ever worked with the sweetest person i cannot speak higher of her laura tabasso my other assistant is in the northfield office nancy's helping me in the egg harbor township office right now so she's going back and forth laura tabasso is my other pta she's been with me four years again she knows things before i even say them or think we're on such a good such a good um just been working together for so long and another amazing human wonderful person fun funny Everybody loves her great manual skills. And then we just hired Dan Gurin, who is a Love Norfield me. guy. I've heard nothing but good things. He used to run Bacharach Sports Medicine for years. Uh, he's got a ton ton of credentials, a ton of uh, sports med. And he started with us two weeks ago, and I've heard nothing but great things. So I'm happy to bring him on. I'm going to shout out my team real quick with Josh mm-hmm. Holsupple. Uh, like, I got to go. I got to tell you, he's he edits all these videos and he's puts amazing. them up. And he's an amazing coach. I'll tell you what. He was a student of mine who I saw, like, paid attention to the tiniest detail yeah. and i'm like 
I don't know what he's doing for what he plans on doing, whatever. But if I could hire yeah. that kid, if I could take that, and then he had an opportunity to do it, I took it immediately. And uh, he's been running things for for me for the past probably two years. And I'm telling you, this business has grown sure dramatically. Because Super of smart, him. really good. Yeah. Um, so and, and very. And, I mean, I would put him up against anybody in a debate. Just going, I'll yeah. let him. Just let him go. Right? <laughs> right. Not even me. Right. I'd be. I think he could do it better than me. Um, and go ahead and just debate you on on training acumen because yeah, he's sure. done it all. Like he went from every single online certification to every single yeah. you know thing there could have been. And he'll argue with me sometimes. And, and sometimes he's he's right on an argument. Yeah. But I'll go. Doesn't make sense business wise though. So we don't do it. <laughs> we don't do it if it doesn't make sense you know business wise. So we, we can't do it. Although he wants to and he's yeah, trying to change good. me to do it. And I've learned. Uh, I've actually probably learned more from him than he's learned from me. So yeah. totally appreciate my team. Yeah. That's it. I got one. Yeah, know, the team but, team is everything. Again, yeah. That goes back to culture and everything else. And you need good people around you. And it's not right. It's not independence. It's interdependence. It's a quote that always stuck home with me. And it's about the team and, and your family and having the right people around you. Yeah, we we together we've uh, we started you know praying with our athletes. We've started we started a Bible study. Um, you know, totally voluntary. They didn't have to go. Yeah, or whatever. But cool. the the response we've gotten is great. And uh, I think our cultures and and being around each other and doing this every week and, and being consistent with it. Uh, I'm, I'm I couldn't be more happy. I oh, feel complete so right now. Yeah. I don't feel my life is complete unless I'm around you. <laughs> it's, it's, we've, it's, we've known each other for a long time. Hundred percent. We've been, been wanting great. to do th things for years. So this yeah. has been awesome. So thanks for coming on and all your. Uh, hard work and your dedication and, and staying right here in South Jersey not stealing your way to one of the big markets. <laughs> Thank you. And Learning play testing has its limits and I think the Tracer, and this is gets me excited, but if we can hook them up to a Tracer, we can have true objective data even better than what we're doing now. And, and that's why the return to play testing, it's still evolving, it's progressing, it needs to continue to evolve because we're not perfect at it. But something like the Tracer, like that's kind of game changing for me. For that. <laughs>